we're hoping he's going to come back. Uh, but he wrote to me and said, you know, it's 5 o'clock in Tel Aviv, so I can be comfortably at home and listen. I don't have to get up at right. 6 o'clock in the morning. So you can say hi to him. Mm -hmm. What is it? I always wonder when Max and PCs get together. <laughs> right. So the same day. <laughs> really? Yeah, she was. Uh, she doesn't like the all the notifications that come. Like you have to double double click to get to your screen. It's the double click, and then it's the audio for the charging. Because I typically wear the earpiece oh, that goes uh, yeah. that plugs in. And I'm on the phone all the time, so I burn through the battery like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I gotta yeah. get the Bluetooth, but I'm yeah. so bad with like organization in regards to. I go through like. So you can't plug in. There's this is the only thing that you can use to listen. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. So it's where you charge and where you. I thought that they came with the new wireless. To buy those. Come on, really? <laughs> yeah. Extra. And the thing oh. that scares me is I'm like, just the regular ones with the wire itself. I. Probably lose one a week. Yeah, right. And so I'm thinking the wireless in itself, just how little they are. Well, I worry. Go. I was that's on my list of things to get my wife for her birthday, and I was like, do I do it? Do I not? Because <laughs> she's such an athlete that um, I think not having the wires is going to be great. Yeah. Well, my husband's really like he digs it. He thinks it's fantastic. So he likes the phone. Yeah. Uh, okay. But he's he's good at the wire part, or, or the wireless, uh -huh. I just never got used to that, mm -hmm. so don't forget I have it in my head, or <laughs> just yeah. Yeah. keep an organization of it. Yeah.
long trip to get up there. Who's not? No, I've only ever done Out of reach. Because we like the outside audience, so um, that was the only thing. My, my guy, I I know that with people streaming in, then you can't see it.
Hey, yeah, I've been sharp. I skipped last week. I had the dog suit. You had a dog suit? Yeah, when he was in Colorado. I already forgot last week. Who was last week's speaker? It was very good. Oh, no, it was our out of town guy from St. Louis. He was very good. What are you talking about? Pediatric yeah. asthma, but some cutting edge research, even some unpublished stuff. You were here, weren't you, Alex? Anything uh, I should know about it? Speaker, huh? Any new? Anything new? Okay. Take care of a lot of Pete's. We insist it apply to adults too. Uh, yeah, he had. Um, yeah. You know that's been banned around for the last twenty-five years, though. He, he's a proponent. I take it. He's got some evidence. He has some evidence that it's. And the other thing, um, I remember what it was. It was. Uh, Features of the asthma. Yeah, like the yeah, the yeah, the 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 neutrophilic versus that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You see, asthma. Or you, what were the two criteria? Elevated eosinophils. Yes. Oh. Obviously, eosinophils the response, and if it, they don't have eosinophils, well, it doesn't, right? <laughs> How come you didn't come and you know more than we do? <laughs> <laughs> the, point, the point you really made. Was, I mean, that's obvious. The point. point you really made. Yeah, he compared Montelukast with inhaled steroid with intermittent. Yeah, you can listen to it. It was actually a good talk. He's obviously forgotten virtually all Why of it. Why did you say <laughs> Guys will do. You get calls from the IRS. 
Yes. Like, you better give me your social security number. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> and I, of course, oh, I gave it to him. Five, five three, nine. <laughs> the worst spam we got was um, my wife. Uh, I got out to her outbox. So everyone she knew got a message from Kenya saying that she was on vacation. So they they went in before they sent the message, changed her oh, wow. message so that well, you're gonna, you're you were going to get in, but then she had to find her phone and way down. Think about yeah. where yours is. <laughs> <laughs> I can't find mine. Yeah. 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 So then yeah. you're stuck, and then you just lost like your name at Google.com. Wow. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. James. Yeah. Is that right, Dave? Yeah. Or his cousin, yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. I couldn't get to it until the end of the day, so he had like 30 emails out there. Yeah. So they're, they're, yeah they're, thankfully, they're, people aren't like creative. Yeah. <laughs> this was like five or six years ago before I'd heard of it. Well, I remember the very first time. This is about five years ago. You know, you're, uh, don't worry, your credit card's okay, but you need to call us, and it's a computerized message. It sounds official. I said, yeah, put in your social security number. <laughs> put in your credit card number. I actually, the very first time I sucked it, when I got done with that, I said, hey, something's crazy. Now. So I immediately canceled it you know, and went back. Next morning, I called them because I had to change my credit card numbers and everything like that. And they said that in Boston, they tried to make three or four charges already on it. They didn't get it because I had blocked. But I've had that at least five times, five or six times. I get the money and send money to Kenya stuff. I don't get those. <laughs> it's usually Nigeria. It's usually Nigeria. I get those. I don't suck in on those. Make it to Most people, people make the team know what's going on here. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> take two. Wallpaper your bathroom. This concludes the sequel. Thank you. 
I know. Sports this morning. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so right. Yes. That's right. Well, and then when's Dan's boards? He'll be sleeping today as well. That's what I'm wondering. I think it might be. Yeah. Oh, they're boards. Sure, we just, um, FYI, the Northwest Allergy Forum is on Saturday and Sunday. It's not at the W Hotel. Um, let's see. Uh, speakers, um, Linda Cox, Hal Nelson, Eric Macy, and I can't remember there's another person. Um, and if you haven't signed up or you need to sign up, and you're Drew as a speaker, okay, good. Um, and then um, talk to Nicole at our office. But if, and you get your CME through the American Academy. Can I put in a plug for not doing it the uh, weekends the Husky football game? Well, you time? know what? The, it is a problem because <laughs> I understand because my husband's a beaver believer. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what? The hard part is when they set this up a year in advance, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't have the Husky schedule. So yeah. they just have to pick a weekend and, and like knock, lock it out down. Yeah. But yeah, normally they try to look at Husky weekends, Seahawk weekends, yeah, and have it be an away game, but it just it's a bummer this yeah. year. But the game doesn't start till 3.30. True. So you could go for the morning. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Okay. okay. Uh, all right, so uh, this morning for those on the outside, the word again is what, immune? Immune. Yeah. And we have a change in topic and a change in speaker a little confusion, um, well, which I don't understand the miscommunication. Anyway, I need to thank Eric Allenspach, who filled in on short notice. Thanks very much. Um, David Hagen, if you're listening over in Tel Aviv, uh, he remembers you well from your mutual fellowship, so you can uh, send a hello to my email if you like. Um, so we've got a presentation today titled Genomic Variation, Human Immune Deficiencies and Polymorphisms uh, Among Us, or Amongst Us. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, for inviting me. You know, I'm filling in, but it's exciting to be able to um, tell you guys. I, I mainly am 80% research. Seattle Children's um, and do 10% rheumatology, 10% immunology. So I, I really take the curveballs and try to figure out uh, some of the otter case presentations. And some of it, um, what I hope to share with you is not detailed, uh, nitty gritty, basic science, but, but really how can you take some of the unusual case presentations? How can you get to either an answer or something that you can actionably change how you treat these patients. And I think some of the answers for us as we're diving deeper is uh, a little bit surprising. Some of the things we thought were just exclusively like skid mutations are turning out to pop up in adult immune deficiencies. So um, I do, I just finished a grant uh, on, for Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals and I'm funded by the um, I'm going to go over a few things. First, just normal human T cell development. Most of the talk, the immune deficiencies that have been, I think, the best worked out are T cell disorders. Um, and I'm going to go over uh, a skid presentation. Actually, this was one of my first skid babies that uh, Drew was the attending. Uh, I think he was one of his first calls as an attending, and I was. Uh, on and and then how that relates to adult immune deficiencies, IPEX IPEX like disease. So you guys don't see a lot of IPEX, but um, IPEX like might land in your clinic. Uh, and then disorders of cytokine regulation. This is some of the newer disorders that have been coming out that are dominant disorders that only take one hit uh, and very very frequently are just passed off as a lung disease. Um, I'm going to briefly at the end, hopefully we have time, just to tell you um, a quick snippet and a, a, a punch for where I think things are going and a lot of the polymorphisms explain a lot of the diseases. 
And you can take this model, I think, for allergy, which is what uh, Josh Milner at the NIH is doing, is finding um, these severely atopic kids, finding the genes that cause early disease, and then they're finding the adult patients with SNPs or polymorphisms in those genes. So I think we can learn from the early onset cases. So this is just review for most people. We consider four major compartments of the immune system. You have complement phagocytes, which are the innate side, um, not having a lot of specificity to them. Um, but uh, I'm not going to talk on that today. And then you have your T cell compartment and your B cell compartment, where if you lack a T cell compartment, you basically have combined immune deficiency. Um, and your B cell, you can have a specific deficiency in B cells. Just very basic, um, we all know that uh, T-cell education occurs in the thymus, where VDJ recombination happens. Um, that's going to be important in a second to so generate a random uh, receptor generation um, through a recombination of your DNA, and that creates your peripheral pool of alpha-beta T-cells. When this happens, I think it's quite interesting. Most people don't realize, but your T cells start coming out at gestation age about 13 weeks in the human. Um, you start to first generate your gamma delta T cells, and which are your invariant T cells. They go to your skin, your gut. Um, they're usually recognizing some non-variant part of your body. And then you get your alpha-beta T cells, and shortly after they start to come out, you get your FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells. And so after that, you know, this period between 17 weeks and 40 weeks is really a black box. We don't know what they're doing. We don't know why they need all that time to develop, whether they're tolerizing to ourselves. So I think it's a fascinating part of immunology that... I'd like to dive into a little bit more. So let me tell you about this first case presentation. So just to remind you guys, if at any point during fetal development, you get a, a rest in alpha-beta T-cell generation, you basically get the phenotype of the skid. Um, and this was uh, a case that I wanted to highlight because it was not a lymphopenic baby. Um, and there's a big change in the way we deal with skid babies now with newborn screening that I think everyone in the room needs to know about, um, if you don't already. But a 10-week-old infant with severe atopic dermatitis and lymphadenopathy, the dermatologist that got called to this case was uh, savvy enough to see the lymphadenopathy and called the immunologist. And as you can see, IgE level 4,412. Uh, IgG level was low, and then if you just look at the T cells, if you just did an ALC count, you might you know miss this. But if you dive deeper, you, a CD4 to CD8 ratio of 16 is obviously abnormal. Um, and then if you dive deeper, CD45 RA is your naive population. CD45 uh, RO is your memory population, and this baby already is skewed, and this is maternal engraftment or Omen syndrome, which is activated T cells. And so this baby ended up having a RAG1 um, form of skid, but just to remind you guys, in order to do... There's a pointer on the computer. Right. Uh, there VDJ go. is variable... What is that? Name? Variable diversity junction. Diversity. Yep. And so... The variable regions, you have lots of those genes, and you have lots of diversity regions, and lots of J regions. And when they come together, they, whoops, that's kind of So the specifics of VDJ recombination, I think, are not, um, you guys can look that up. I don't think it's uh, going to play a role in the clinic um, very much, but... It ends up, I think the important thing is that it makes this. And I'll show you that in a second. When you do this, for people on the outside, yeah. you can see that. So it's trying to make that work. This guy right here, 
is called a TREC, or a T-cell receptor excision circle. So skid is now not a disease of a sick baby. So our, my second skid case, the kid was completely healthy, like appearing, but was a skid baby. And so the reason for that is because we've developed a, a TREC screening. It's a newborn screen. And I think getting the education out to people, uh, the grandma that was in the room was like, no, I'm a nurse. I know skid is, is very sick babies. This is not a skid baby. And so we had to do a lot of education surrounding what that means. And so I'm showing you the specifics of the TCR alpha locus, but basically the D region, which is for gamma delta uh, T cells, not the diversity regions, which I was uh, saying earlier, the gamma delta locus is in between the alpha locus. And so when the alpha beta T cells make the receptor, they cut out this delta region. And what happens is, if you can see on the bottom left, the T cell has CD45RA, so that's a naive T cell, freshly <laughs> out of the thymus, and it has that little excision circle. And as it divides, it ends up losing it. So you, know, you don't re, uh, reproduce that trek. As you divide, you divide all of your DNA and reproduce that DNA, but you don't reproduce that trek. So as the T cells divide, they lose that. And so our uh, RAG1 deficient skid baby would have been picked up by this. Even though it had a lot of lymphocytes, it would have looked like CD45 all the way to the right, one little copy of trek, and then the rest of the cells would have been negative. And that's because a few cells get out and proliferate but they're auto-reactive, and that's what caused the skid phenotype. And so, and please interrupt if you guys have questions at all. Um, this is now in almost all states. So all the blue states currently screen newborn babies for the skid uh, TREC assay. Each state has their own cutoff, so you have to check with your newborn screening lab for how they do it, but we wear pagers when we're on call, and they call us um, if they have a result. Usually these are completely healthy looking babies at home. And the important thing is we have a stepwise um, method in, in going through that, not to alarm the family, but to catch all the, uh, the uh, skid babies. There's three states that are not doing this. Um, but this is why we do it. If you, tr these are transplant outcomes, early versus late treatment, and this is from <coughs> Rebecca Buckley over in Duke uh, in a retrospective analysis of all of her cases. And she used age of onset of transplant. So if you were less than 3.5 months of age, you did fantastic, 96% engraftment and, and completely cured. Whereas if you waited, and if the presentation was late, you didn't do very well. 66% is not what I would want you know, for my kid. And so what the difference is, we've now, through the Primary Immune Deficiency Trans Treatment Consortium, we looked at all the data, and it's not really the age. It's actually whether they're infected or not. And so the older kids, the greater than 3.5 months of age, most of those had an infection, whereas the younger kids didn't. And so that's an important concept um, to really, the one thing that we're missing with the TREC assay is ADA skid. Um, so ADA is adenosine deaminase 1, uh, and that's one of the more common forms of skid, and we're working on how to get that into the newborn screen. Now that you have this screening almost nationwide, how common do you, are we learning that SCID is, the frequency? Yeah, so we get about two cases a year. Um, and then we're, we get another couple from uh, the Whammy region. Um, so it ends up, um, Wisconsin actually did a cost-effective analysis, because to get it on the newborn screen, you have to actually show politicians that it makes sense. Um, and 
it actually is cost effective. Uh, long term stays in the NICU is not uh, very cheap. And so it ends up, they did cost effective analysis, published that in JAMA, and then it's just gone nationwide after you show that it's cost effective. So if you want more information about that, it's the SCID initiative on the Immune Deficiency Foundation website. They have handouts for families. If, if you knew somebody that had, a, you know, someone called them. We're trying to educate a lot of community pediatricians um, because they're often the ones calling, which, you know, is plus and minus if they don't know a lot about SCID. Um, and this is an example of a handout that we give. Um, it's really a test for lymphopenia. So our DeGeorge patients, um, and if you're athymic, you're going to come up in this. And then some of our NICU babies that are extremely sick come up positive. So we do have some decision making to do. Um, and that's why the newborn screening lab calls us to kind of interpret things. So we've come up with a lot of mutations. These are just the common ones. So walking you from the left to the right in the bone marrow, you have hematopoietic stem cells that then, as you move from the left to the right, you're getting more and more uh, restricted on what type of cell you can become. So there's common lymphoid progenitors that then um, early lymphoid progenitor goes to the thymus, becomes either a CD4 or CD8 T cell. You have your NK cells and your B cells. And this gives you your T positive or T negative, B positive, NK positive skid. There's all the different flavors. Um, but RAG1 and RAG2, you can see at the bottom with all the DNA defects. So now kind of shifting back, what can, why do you guys have to care about um, skin? And this is a fantastic article actually. They did a 30-year um, uh, review on David, the boy in the bubble. Um, there was the you know, great movie by uh, John Travolta on the boy in the bubble, but People actually know this, and it's helpful when we get a skid, uh, baby. The family actually does go to this and look at it. But um, but this was Bill Sher, um, who was the doctor for David, and um, very prominent um, member of the allergy community. And Gigi Notarangelo's group in Boston has gone on. This is a very busy slide, but all you have to know is people went through the genes. So this is taking one of the two RAG proteins. So RAG1, if you, it depends on your mutation, what the phenotype is. And so in part A, it's just a diagram of the protein. All the different numbers are the amino acid changes that happen. In B, that's the recombinase activity. So what they did is they put a good copy of RAG2 and then they took the patient's RAG1 and put it in and did an assay for how good those two together made recombination work. And so it's an in vitro test of, of what each mutation does. And you can see the, the scale on B, it's not very big, but it's, it's 0 to 140%. And so if you had 100% uh, activity, you're not going to have skid. But what if you had 40%? Or what if you had 20% activity? Are you going to have skid? Or are you going to have an immune dysregulation disorder? Um, we didn't know at the time. And so at the bottom is a graphical representation of people's repertoire. And so as alpha, beta, T cells come together, it's completely random. And the CDR3 region, which is the interface between all the different B, D, and J, that makes any receptor that, um, that then gets tested in the thymus. So you have lots of diversity. And so on the left, if you had no mutation, RAG1 and RAG2 creates a very diverse population. Whereas if you only had 5%, which is all the way to the right, and that's a skid baby, a few little cells eke out, but there's not very many of them. And so you get a restriction on your repertoire. 
In between, you can see that there's a restriction in the repertoire if you only have 40% or 20%. And so we're finding those are our adult CVID patients. Um, and so I'll give you a case to represent this. Some people may not know what RAG is. Oh, so recombination. So RAG is a protein. There's two of them. Um, it ends up, they come together and they bind to double-stranded breaks. And so you end up, or they create double-stranded breaks, I'm sorry. Um, and so together they cut the DNA, and, um, and that's their function. That you can't cut the DNA at the V, D, and J regions if you don't have RAG1 and RAG2. So if you're inefficient at cutting that DNA, you can't recombine it to make a VDJ. Does that make sense? So this was a family, um, Hans Ox actually was fallen back in the 1960s um, and had followed, um, Matt Altman actually saw the patient, uh, the 2E patient uh, in clinic just last year. And so this has been a long standing family seen in the immunology clinic. So if you follow the proband is, so this is a genetic tree, you can see the three generations 1A is all the way at the top, which is the mom. And then you see the second generation, which is all the patients that we saw. And then the kids of those are seen in the third, the third line. And so 2F was the proband. She had lots of disease as a kid. She had frequent sinopulmonary infections. She had such bad lung disease that she actually had a left lower lobe removed because she had such a bad socked in pneumonia at the time. Now, you have to remember this is dated a little bit, so some of the things that we would do now, they didn't have back then, but um, she ended up getting portal um, stasis and had a, they, they thought that splenectomy was going to help that. Um, obviously, that didn't. Um, she got liver failure, likely secondary to hepatitis C. And so I never met that woman but her sister had a slightly uh, milder phenotype where she ended up getting started on IVIG because her sister had a severe phenotype. And so not knowing exactly what the cause of her disease was, IVIG was started. She had persistent sinopulmonary infections. She had conjunctivitis. Um, she, it's unclear whether when she was 24, she had two twins. Um, and one of them died of sepsis. We've tested them, they, they do not have uh, the mutations, and so it's unclear why that happened. Uh, but she did go off of IVIG, and the family has been on and off because, you know, as you become an adolescent, you decide that you know what's best. Um, but 24 to 52, she just has progressed on to be a CVID. So, bronchiectasis, bad lung disease, recurrent sinopulmonary infections. The one thing tying all three of these patients together was lymphopenia, as you see at the bottom. That is a not a normal ALC, especially in the setting of that white blood cell count. So this just shows you one assay that we have in the lab that's now FDA. Um, we have an a IND out to the FDA to actually allow other centers to be doing this. This is what's called bacteriophage immunization. You see Hans Ox and uh, Starkey Davis, which were in Ralph Wedgwood's lab creating this assay. It's genius. It basically allows you to immunize someone while they're on IVIG. Um, and bacteriophage actually infects. It's a virus for bacteria. So it doesn't make you sick at all. It just uh, is a virus-like particle that you're able to immunize someone against. And then you're able to look at a primary response. You're able to give it again and look at a secondary response, all while your patient is safe on IVIG. So this is showing you the results from our family, which the top three uh, blue column or rows are our three affected patients 
And you don't have to know kind of the specifics, but if you go to the right, the top two patients are the most severe phenotype, and they don't respond very well um, compared to the hundreds and even sometimes thousands uh, of detectable levels of response against. These are units, and so you're measuring that. Uh, it, it's not actually like immunoglobulin titers and things like that. So you have to have a lab that knows what they're doing. But even after repetitive immunization, some of these patients were not able to respond. So we had a combined immunodeficiency, likely autosomal recessive. Uh, the commonalities between the patients were lymphopenia, lack of T-dependent antibody responses, they did get viral infections, and they got sinopulmonary uh, infections with bronchiectasis. So when I started in fellowship, I got really interested in um, genomics, and people debate this right now. It's a hotly contested topic about whether we should spend all this money to do exome sequencing. And it's really not, um, it's getting a lot cheaper. Um, and I think it's very important. Um, about 25%, so the one thing I'd like you to come away with, if you clinically think the patient has something, your opinion matters way more than a genetic result. Um, because if I think a patient looks like an XLA patient and I can't find a mutation, they're still XLA. It's a clinical diagnosis, and we just have not yet found the genetic defect that causes it. Um, so 25% of exomes are solved. That tells you that there's a lot of different ways that you can um, end up getting a genetic lesion that causes a genetic disorder. So what is an exome? So you have 3 billion base pairs in your whole genome. An exome just takes out the regions of the genome that actually encode for a protein. And so introns are regulatory regions that don't encode for a protein, but are likely important. So if you have a critical region that regulates RAG, that might cause a phenotype. Um, it might not get picked up if you're only looking at coding regions. So exomes are really just looking at 1% of your genome. So if you get a negative clinical exome, or if a family comes to you and said, I had my exomes done, and they're negative, no one can figure me out, you can still keep going. There are things that you can do, but you, you'll need help and have people that understand the disease. We did, for reasons I won't get into, we did whole genomes, but I found RAG2 mutations in this family. And so what this is showing, on um, this is what an exome looks like. And it ends up being the, the vertical columns that are in gray end up showing you how many times that nucleotide was detected in that patient. And so that's what's called depth of coverage. And so the other thing is, clinically, you can order an exome from GeneDx. Uh, you can order up that test, and it'll go through insurance processing. They only test for 10x coverage, meaning you would only get five copies from a mom and five from a dad, and it might not pick up what you're looking for. So it's very hard to tell a sequencing error from good clinical five copies from your mom or your dad, unless you have more coverage. And unfortunately, more coverage means more expensive, and so these gene testing companies have been guaranteeing you 10x coverage for 90% of your genomes. So it matters where you send it. It matters who's doing it. Um, but if you have a very unique family that you're following, it's, I think, very, it can be very critical to understanding the disease. So why did these patients end up getting a CVID-like picture? Well, it's not completely understood, but uh, Gigi's group went on to look at all the patients. So on the left 
is all of the control patients. Um, so you don't have intensity. Sorry, I'll back up. This is an antibody dependent uh, assay. So you're looking at proteins on a chip and you're looking at the patient's serum coming in. And so on the um, bottom, you'll see the axis. Blue means you're not reacting at all. Red means you're very highly reacting. And so you'll see that all the patients on the right, which are various forms of SCID patients, either SCID, combined variable, they all have RAG mutations. They are making autoantibodies against type 1 interferon. And so this is skewing them. And I'll show you in uh, later slides how skewing of your immune system gives you the clinical phenotype. But, yeah? Is this a positive enough test that this kid would show up with a positive ANA, or are these titers too low to show up on our standard screening test? No, these, um, they, they show up for ANAs. I'm not showing you the full array, but um, they ran, you know, Anti-thyroid uh, thyroid peroxidase. Um, uh, they ended up doing a lot of clinical tests. We don't tend to send the interferon type one interferon testing, but ANAs would come up. Yeah. So this is the new diagram for how we consider RAG mutations. So it used to be if you had a RAG mutation, you were skid. Um, that was just the way. It, it went, but we now know it's important to know what your mutation is, and it could be that autoimmunity is your presentation. It could be that frequent infections is your uh, presentation. You have just enough rag activity to get your cells out so that you're not skid, but those kids might end up as the early adolescent in your clinic. So for this part of the talk, RAG1, RAG2, Mutations result in a spectrum of immune deficiency diseases, and skid phenotypes can be classic or omen like, which is the um, skid presentation I showed you. Um, older and adult presentations occur, and those are termed either leaky skid or combined immunodeficiencies. Um, CBID patients with lymphopenia should be considered for RAG testing or just referred uh, to a tertiary center. I have a question. Yeah. The older presentation, I mean, obviously this is a genetic defect from birth, but you're just saying clinically they don't present with disease until later in life? I mean, all of our patients, if you dug back on the history, had stuff. Um, the problem is, I've experienced this at least in rheumatology, that you, know, you don't have time to always dive back and, and do detailed family history. And so, and they're always not... They're not good at giving uh, family history sometimes. So you might see a patient that, that looked uh, like chronic interstitial lung disease and had restricted pattern, and, um, and they didn't tell you about all the pneumonia, pneumonias that they had as a kid. Um, it's just if, if they start to have a more complex picture, you know, it, it could be that's what it is. And I don't think we know if you had 80% or 60% activity, would that be even a milder phenotype? And now later in life, you have CBID. Um, we just are not screening the patients enough. So this is kind of a, a backbone for the rest of the talk. So this is um, your helper T cell and what it can become. So I like this diagram because it tells me how the immune system kind of compartmentalizes how you deal with uh, immune uh, reactions. So if you get a helminth infection, you skew towards Th2. But if you have extracellular bacteria or fungi, you need Th17 cells in, the, in order to fight that infection. So has everyone um, heard of the Th17 paradigm? It used to be Th1, Th2, and now it's growing. I'm actually even simplifying it here now TH9 and TH22 that people argue about, but I think that this is good. Um, it's basically the cytokines that they make. So if you add in a little bit of details, TH17 cells were named because they make 17, or IL-17, and it's not that there's TH1 through TH17. Um, they're named after the cytokines that they make. 
uh, at least the more recent ones. Th1 cells are meant to fight intracellular pathogens, so either a protozoa or like mycobacterial infections. Um, and what's important is you can get lesions, genetic lesions, at various different spots that either make it impossible for you to become that cell, or you can't respond to the cytokine that they make, and you get very similar phenotypes. So I'm going to go through a couple of each of these to show you how these lesions could present. So the first one is IPEX and IPEX light. So I told you in the beginning that you make a whole bunch of alpha beta T cells, but you need to control these cells because they don't see everything in the thymus. And as you uh, develop, you might develop new antigens, you might get new gut microbiota or stuff in your nasal pharynx, um, and so you need to be able to adjust a little bit, and it's based on signal strength. You can either re recognize something in the thymus and get clonally deleted, uh, which is seen in number one, or you can go out into the periphery and be regulated if you're too strongly self-reactive by regulatory T cells. And so we know this because if you have a deficiency in T regs, which I'll show you is uh, genetically caused by deletions in FOXP3, you get a very severe early onset phenotype, which is IPEX, immune dysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, excellent. And so FOXP3 is a gene lo localized on the X chromosome. If you get one single uh, deleterious uh, mutation on that region, you end up getting this syndrome. It's almost universally having uh, enteropathy. Uh, you have bad diarrhea, so uh, don't forget to ask your patients about uh, bowel, bowel habits. Uh, I know it's uncomfortable. But the dermatitis is the second most common thing. You end up uh, getting very, very refractory eczema. Uh, some of the patients get neonatal diabetes. Sometimes this is a little bit later. And they almost universally, if it's an early presentation, have a failure to thrive. When I was a resident, I was privy to a case in the NICU where uh, this, this baby's brother had IPEX. Mom got pregnant again and unfortunately had another child with the same genetic lesion. This baby had pulmonary hypoplasia for reasons that we don't understand. Um, and passed away at one day of life. What was really surprising is when you looked at the pancreas, I'm, I'm showing you pictures of the pancreas right now, they had tertiary lymphoid structures in the pancreas. So that's at day of life one. And so we've gone on to do a lot of testing to show that this starts in utero. So that slide I showed you in the beginning where alpha beta T cells start coming out at 13 weeks of gestation, probably that you need Tregs in utero to control stuff. We know that if you have <clears throat> defective Tregs on the maternal side, you reject a lot of pregnancies. But no one has looked on the in utero side for these babies, because usually they're born at term. But this baby was not diabetic yet. And if you stain for insulin, uh, you actually get a lot of staining. So it's, it's kind of an intermediate phase. But there's clearly T cells and B cells, which are the CD20 positives uh, staining. And then at the bottom, you see the flavors of the T cells, CD4 and CD8. And so this is clearly happening in utero. But we thought we knew everything about this. There's about uh, over 100 cases worldwide. But now we're getting referrals, as Troy is now one of the uh, international experts on the IPACs. We're getting referrals from older patients. So these are patients in their late teens, early 20s that are coming with really refractory enteropathy. And, um, and so we're still learning about this disease. And it's likely, it depends on what genetic lesion that they have. So I'm just trying to deconstruct this idea for you that a gene mutation equals a disease matters what gene mutation it is and how it affects the protein function. And so it ends up just getting just another layer 
uh, of information can help you a lot. So what do Tregs do? Um, so they're critically important if you lack them in the beginning of life, you get a bad disease. Um, we don't know, uh, is the first answer. Um, they do a lot of things, and so what I'm showing you here is, in the bottom right, you have a help, naive helper T cell. This is a CD4 cell. It gets a signal through cytokines, either IL-2 or TGF-beta, with transcription factors, which is FOXP3, that's the mutation in IPEX, um, or STAT5, which there are a few rare patients that they lack that, they lack Tregs. And then they become a Treg. But then what do they do at that stage? Well, they use surface molecules like CTLA-4 um, that can <coughs> negatively regulate your antigen-presenting cells. So I'm showing you an immature dendritic cell that when it engulfs a bacteria, so PAMP is kind of this big term to incorporate anything from a bacteria, fungi, virus. It's basically this alarm signal that tells your immune system to start upregulating things that need to activate your immune system. And so CTLA-4 is a down modulator. So it ends up calming things down, and it blocks DC maturation. So at the top, you'll see a mature DC, has lots of MHC class two, lots of post-stimulatory molecules, and it's able to control your T effector cells. And so Tregs have also been shown to block the activation of the effector T cell. So when we went back, so Troy has about 400 patients that don't have, I, or don't have FOXP3 mutations. They don't have STAT5 mutations, but they clearly have IPEX. So that's a new category called IPEX light. And I needed to tell you guys about this one because this has a lot of adult presentations. And it's because of something we don't understand, which is incomplete penetrance of this mutation. So CTLA-4, if, if you go back a slide, that's that molecule in yellow, that's the down modulator. We don't know where it's affecting because it also pops up after you activate a effector T cell on that cell. So it could be acting at a lot of different areas. But if you lack one copy of that, so it's a haplo insufficiency, so you can have one good copy and one bad copy, so just one hit can cause this severe disease, which is really impressive. Um, and what the commonalities are, which you can see on the right, severe cytopenias, gut inflammation, lung inflammation, and the lung disease is basically, we're going through a lot of our CVID patients, we found four. Um, out of a cohort of about 40. So, you know, 10%, that's roughly equivalent to what people have been finding when they went back and uh, sought out these rare causes of CVID. So CVID is likely this waste bag diagnosis, that there's a lot of ways to get to CVID, but this could be one of them. And so... On the left, I'm showing you some of the lesions that can be in the brain. So we've had an isolated brain lesion. Um, it can be mistaken for MS. You can have these um, severe interstitial lung disease. And you'll see if you look at the family trees, the ones in red are the affected patients with the mutation. The ones in pink have the mutation but are not yet symptomatic which that's the part that we don't understand. How can you have this haplo insufficiency but not yet you know, clinically present? And so that's the hard part. And what do you do if a sibling had the mutation but yet was clinically asymptomatic and they're a kid? What do you do there? So we have a lot to learn, but we have had adult presentations, so nothing until the age of like you know, 18, 19, and then started to present with symptoms. But frequently they do present with early onset, so if you ask a family history, you might, uh, might be hurt. 
This was also described in Nature Medicine, and this breaks down for you all the different percentages of, of symptomatology. So really, enteropathy is up there uh, high again. So just like IPEX, enteropathy ends up being a big one. So if you have a patient with interstitial lung disease and uh, like frequent diarrhea, frequent enteropathy that has been kind of lifelong, they just put up with it, definitely consider uh, endoscopy and sending them to GI. We found as we're going down uh, the list of different genes that relate to CTLA-4, <laughs> LRBA is a protein that helps CTLA-4 recycle <coughs> off of the cell surface. That also causes IPEX-like disease. And so we're starting to realize if you hit a pathway, start to look at the proteins around that pathway, and it's likely that we're going to pick off patients' uh, ideologies for why they have disease. So IPEX inflammation likely starts in utero if you have a FOXP3 mutation. Um, However, we're being humbled. Um, IPEX has had some late onset presentations. I don't think that they're going to uh, wind up in an allergy clinic. It's more the gastroenterologist that we need to really uh, hammer this into for the late presentations. Yeah? You said that 88% of newborns are being screened. Are they using these tests on amniocentesis samples as well or just on newborns? Um, so, newborns are being screened for SCID, which is the lymphopenia test. And so, these patients have plenty of T-cells. And so, they're not going to be picked up by that. But the amniocentesis, as a lot of people shift over to the cell-free DNA and don't do the amnio, we could do genetic screening. The problem is, then what do you do with the information? That gets into this like incomplete penetrance. If I had a baby with CTLA-4 haploid insufficiency, what do I do with the baby? They're fine. They might not present. You know, so it's 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 a complicated issue with newborn screening. So we do newborn screening because if you have skid at at when you're born, you're not going to make it. So it's it's lethal. Whereas some of these mutations, you have to kind of see how it plays out. I'm a little confused. The IPEX light is essentially an overactive immune system because you're lacking a regulatory mechanism. CVID is just the opposite. You don't have immunoglobulin. So how do they have the same presentation? Or opposite ends of the immune system. So we're finding that actually a lot of the CVID patients present with autoimmunity too. So, you know, how does that happen? So I think it's how you skew your immune system. And so that's kind of if you lack regulatory T cells, you know, do you make autoantibodies against, you know, interferon gamma and you can't respond? And so I'll show you some examples of that, where you can make antibodies against a cytokine that you need to clear an infection, and then you present just like the deficiency. So how much time do we have? Ten minutes. So this is an example of all the different ways you could get the immune deficiency. Chronic cutaneous or mucocutaneous candidiasis. Right, so this ends up being something that you recognize in clinic. They're clearly uh, adult with thrush, uh, severe candidiasis infections. There's a lot of different ways you can get there. I'm not going to focus on the hyper IgE syndrome a lot, but exactly to your question, you could have deficiency in the cytokine, which is IL-17. You could have deficiency in the receptor responding to that cytokine, which is IL-17 receptor. Or, in some of these bottom ones, you get autoantibodies against IL-17, and you present with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. So I think this, if you ever see patients that look like this, this is taken from the New England Journal of Medicine article showing different ethnicities that get hyper-IgE syndrome. Um, so you get a, a wide nasal presentation, so it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, although the bottom left patient, I, I was a little confused by, but um, 
The nice thing is we've got a patient that we have pictures of over time. And you can see there's a couple features. One is the, the eyebrows, like a prominent sort of eyebrow presentation, wide um, inner alial uh, width in the nose, and you get um, the chronic cutaneous, uh, mucocutaneous candidiasis. You get retained teeth, which is shown down on the bottom right. You get uh, lung cysts. So that's some of the presentations that you get. High IgE might land them in your clinic. Uh, although there is a couple patients only in the single thousand range, most of them are above 10,000. Um, but they get severe boils, which is you know the Job syndrome, that's why it was named that. You get eczema and scoliosis. But I think this demonstrates the complexity of exactly your question. How can this be a deficiency and autoimmunity at the same time? And these proteins don't function in a vacuum. They, they negatively regulate each other. And when that happens, the dose matters. And so if you have a deficiency, which is shown on the left, the loss of function of STAT3 gives you high IgE, decreased Th17 cells, and so that's mimicked on the left in the diagram. You basically, your cells are skewed towards Th2 and skewed towards Th1 because you can't make Th17. So a T cell wants to become skewed to, to something, and so if you block one pathway, it skews to the other. Um, you end up getting uh, infections such as pneumonias, you get dermatitis. On the flip side, if you skew heavily towards Th17 cells, you start to de develop an IPEX-like syndrome. And you end up getting this defect in making your Tregs because you're shunting them all towards Th17. So, when you push on one side of the immune system, the other side ends up flexing. And that was kind of the, the thing that we're learning with a lot of these. When you get overactivation of one side, you might get deficiency on the other. And I think that's best demonstrated with the Th1 side. So, Mycobacterial or susceptibility to mycobacterial infections. So this is best worked out in uh, outside of this country where they get BCG vaccines. So you give them BCG and then they have a terrible response to that. Uh, but basically anything in this pathway that I'm showing you. So I'm showing you an antigen presenting cell to the left as it ingests a mycobacterial uh, particle or a bacterium. They end up. Um, Responding to that, making IL-12, you need a receptor to respond to the IL-12 that then signals through TIC2 to make STAT4, which is required to make interferon gamma, and you get a loop. So you mutate any of these, and you get Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterial disease. Um, and so we've had a few patients like that. But just like you were saying, you know, how do they have both? You see on the right, if you have a STAT1 gain of function, so if you go back <coughs> here, sorry. if you have STAT1 gain of function, you are forcing the cell to be one thing. And so if you're forcing it to be one thing, it cannot be a TH17 cell. And so you get candidal infections, but it's also, STAT1 is needed to respond to type 1 interferons. And we know from lupus, if you have overactivation of type 1 interferons, you're more likely to develop autoimmunity. So these patients develop autoimmune symptoms, but also have candidal infections. Whereas if you lack STAT1, you just get the infections. So you get mycobacterial disease, you get HSV. And so if you're seeing a complex picture where you're getting both, they're seeing the endocrinologist, they're seeing the gastroenterologist, and they're seeing you, you know, think about these things that it could not, 
they're not just one box. You can have autoimmunity creating the immune deficiency. So what's most challenging, I think, right now, and I'll tie up right now, is you can have loss of function and gain of function just by one hit. And so if you go back, there's um, this is a nice table to just reference for what you get for loss of function or gain of function for a lot of these uh, important modulators of the immune system for cytokine responses. And so I think I'll skip that and just do this, which is genetic variation underlies a lot of early onset immune deficiency disorders. I'm not saying it's everything. There's definitely the microbiota. There's a lot of things that people are starting to discover that are environmentally induced. But it could be that you have a susceptibility genetically to respond to that environment. So as you change it, you might unmask it later. I think a lot of the polymorphisms that we'll find in the genes I talked about may have the subtle effects. And then we can learn from the early onset diseases to teach us about adult diseases. And hypomorphic variants, which just means it, it's not a complete knockout, it's just a subtle decrease in function, may have more of a role in adult disease than we appreciate. And each background is important. The variant that I study in the laboratory is not in Africa at all. It's not in East Asia. It's just in Northern Europeans. And it creates a susceptibility to a lot of autoimmune diseases. So it could be that you need to know what your patient background is. And then genotype is more impactful when functional data exists. So just because you have a mutation, there's a lot of genetic variants of unclear significance. And until they get validated functionally, I don't think we're going to be able to clinically use them. So um, lots of people to thank. Um, I'm employed by the Center for Immunity and Immunotherapies in the Division of Pediatric Immunology. Troy and Suzanne really pioneered the newborn screening in a, uh, in the, a lot of the whammy states. Um, and David Rollins is who I'm working with uh, mainly. Newborn Screening Lab does an amazing job. And then the Center, Center for Mendelian Genomics was able to do a lot of the exome and genome sequencing for us. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> I had a question piped in here. EBIV patients are more likely to develop lymphocyte and interstitial pneumonitis. Is there a correlation between CPRA4 and these patients? Yeah, we've seen like an, an I think there's a, quite an overlap between circulate for haploid insufficiency and CBID. Um, if they have uh, cytopenias, there's, there's one big difference. I haven't seen a lot of CBID patients with profound cytopenias, where a lot of our CTLA4 haploid insufficiency patients um, have that. But if you looked at the chart in the new, um, Nature Medicine paper, only about a third of those patients had cytopenias. So I think it's something that we should definitely put on the radar for CVID patients, especially your refractory ones, because there are treatments. I mean, a Batacept is uh, an infusion medicine that basically gives you back what you're lacking. Um, and with that, you end up, a lot of the patients avoid um, uh, any further complications. A lot of them have been responding to rituxan, um, which fits with a lot of the severe lung disease with CVID. And um, so I think there is an overlap. Other questions? It's obviously not easy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I respect you guys for understanding all yeah. this. Uh, <clears throat> the new world out there. Do you still see adult patients in the clinic? Yep. yep. The age doesn't matter. Well, um, sorry if that was, was it a 
No, it's excellent. It's, yeah. not, it's a very complex field. And those of us who trained I, decades I, ago I, are out of touch. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I, I have to say, unless they need you know, I think they got any at all. Well, maybe your you know, business card. You see someone who uh, doesn't explain how much you can do the right person. You can't leave the room. There's one, you know, we typically send the immunoglobins. We do T cell subsets and bring them for current brain disease. It's shy of Oh, yeah, yeah, you can help out. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, so, so. so we're starting to get uh, um, B cell immunophenotyping. You know, uh, um, that can sometimes be helpful. There's a typical uh, pattern that we're starting to see. Right. Um, as they age, they lose immunoglobulins. Uh -huh. So they can start to be hypogam, but as a kid, they weren't. Right. Um, so I mean, we don't get that. It, how often do you get it so that where like so those screening tests are are normal, say like they're total immunoglobulins are normal? Is it like can you say pretty confident? <laughs> yeah. It's not because I I have to say it's perplexing. We see people all the time that are like, well, we sent our screening tests off, or at least if they saw me, they saw I yeah. gave you a bunch of screening tests, you know, but not we're not looking. So completely normal? Yeah. Well, I have actually, I, I, uh, I have one person who has, uh, he has a defect in his, his IgA levels always come back low and um, a little bit low, they're kind of moderately low, uh -huh. and his IgG levels are normal, but they're kind of towards the lower end of normal. And um, I, you know, I actually sent him to him. Is he progressing? Yeah, so that's the problem is that so he had math um, mm. and a lot of structural lung disease and so we treated him for the math. Oh sorry. And um, didn't didn't really find anything else and then but then it, it came back again, you know, which often happens. But it's in him it's like more severe than our kind of like the normal max. I mean that <clears throat> deserves yeah. a workup for sure. Yeah, like so maybe because a lot of this stuff, like CTLA-4 haplo insufficiency, right. I published it two years ago. Uh -huh. I mean, it's like, right. so right. we've got to keep going back to our patients, and it's just like the patients Hans followed for right. since the 60s. It's like, we uh -huh. just solved that. How long did that take? Yeah. You know, it's like, um, right. so we keep going back. Um, so I think it's worth, like, if it's been 10 years to, uh -huh. to re-see the kid. Yeah. Especially well, for, like, uh, for adult, yeah. He's like in his 60s. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the thing about it, like, wow. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? do now? Yeah, what are you going to do for it? <laughs> I mean, and that's, it. if it's debilitating, yeah, um, and it keeps progressing. Right. Well, that's the problem, I mean, in the literature. When did he present? Like, what age? Yeah, like, in his 50s, he had... Mm -hmm. Um, well, we saw someone actually has classic <coughs> CVID who is like, a, I remember it clearly, like a, this guy is like a 45 year old chiropractor from Alaska. Mm -hmm. who, who was a captain of your catastrophe. He was supposed to have a cough and he had a little chest x ray and eventually like, he sought out a pulmonary down the chair and was, you know, had a really classic CVID. Mm -hmm.